Here at Doxedo Bloom, we're excited about making disciples who impact the city and nations. We hope you enjoy today's message. Well, it is a joy, always such a joy for Liana and myself uh, to be here in Bloemfontein. Obviously, we were anticipating that we would see some of you face to face, uh, but it is what it is. And uh, we are so grateful that in the spirit there is no distance. And uh, as I have the privilege today of sharing the word with you, I know that it can impact your life right there where you are. And so I want to share with you today about uh, the importance of understanding that you're part of a family, a spiritual family, and that God is your Father. Because that understanding is so important in this series that we are busy with, speaking on what on earth am I here for. Uh, to really understand how to position yourself for your calling and your purpose, it starts by understanding you're part of a family. And uh, the theme for what I want to speak to you about today is formed for God's family. You see, uh, we all know the saying that you can choose your friends but not your family, right? But when it gets to your spiritual family, uh, it's just the opposite. We have to understand that uh, as a matter of fact, you have to choose this family, and you must, uh, because you have the opportunity to choose to be able to be part of this incredible family. Christianity is all about family. It's the wonder of the Creator God who, who made everything but had this desire to have a family. And uh, uh, the pathway to this family is through the redemption that Jesus Christ brought on the cross so that now through the cross we can be reconciled with our Father. This is what Jesus told His disciples Speaking to them, documented in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, <laughs> the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father. You see, Jesus is the way to what? To the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. The heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news is about a father that desired to bring humanity, his children, back into a functioning family. And uh, we read this in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18, where uh, God speaks and he says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and my daughters says the Lord Almighty. This is God speaking. He says, I want to be your father, and I want you to be my children, my sons and my daughters. Uh, you see, Christianity is not... Jesus didn't come to start Christianity. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying. Jesus didn't come to offer us another religious option on the market. Jesus came to introduce us to our Father and to be the way back to the Father. We're not competing with some dogmatic or moral code against other religions. What we have is restoration to our Father. That's what sets Christianity apart. And we need to discover this. We need to discover that this is not something we do so that we can qualify, so that God will accept us. No, God took the initiative. When Paul wants us to understand this, he writes in Romans 5, he says, When you were far away, God in His love brought you near. And then he, he goes a little further and he says, When you were sinners, 
not just far, but you were missing the mark. You were living outside of God's purpose. He says, when you were sinners, God reconciled you to himself. But then he comes to verse 10, and, and he wants to reinforce this, this understanding that God took the initiative. Listen to what he says. He says, when we were enemies, not just far, not just sinners, enemies of God, we were reconciled siled with God through the death of His Son. And now that we've been reconciled, He says, how much more will we be saved through His life? We've been reconciled. The dictionary says it means to restore friendly relationships between. That's what happened to us. God came and said, I want to be your father. I want you to experience what it is to have my care and my love and my favor and my smile and my goodness upon your life. God took this initiative. And it was motivated not begrudgingly. God did not engage us, you know, just because there was sympathy for us. No, God loved us, the Bible says. Let me remind you of John 3.16 that says, For God so loved the world, the enemies of God. God loved the world that He gave His Son so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. You see, we have to understand that what happened to us in Adam, in the sin of Adam, is we lost our father. And we became orphans. And the fundamental wounding of humanity is an orphan heart. But the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that we no longer have to live like orphans. We are now invited to come as sons and daughters daughters of the Most High God. The problem with an orphan spirit is that it breeds performance. You always think you have to do something. You always have to do more to qualify. And um, this, this whole way of living, many people bring that spirit, that orphan spirit, into their religious activity, into the church, into their Christian understanding. And then Christianity becomes do, do, do. You have to do all kinds of stuff so that you can qualify, so that at least you can appease God because God's actually angry. God actually doesn't like me. Listen, God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. And, and the problem with performance is the more you perform, the more you have to perform, and it's an exhausting way to live. But Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. <laughs> he knew that was our challenge. He knew that was the thing that we grapple with. He said, I'm going to be the way. I'm going to bring you back to the Father um, so that you can understand this whole concept through the lens of grace. Uh, you know, Jesus was in a way for us a model of that relationship to the Father. And we see things in that relationship that when we discover it, we discover what God's intent is for us. Uh, one of the beautiful moments in Jesus' life is before he goes into his ministry, he gets baptized. And when he gets baptized, he comes up out of the water, and the Bible says, the heavens open and the Father speaks a proclamation over his life. And he says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, God says, I, I love you, you're mine, and I'm pleased with you. What's very important is to understand that when the Father says, I'm pleased with you, it was before Jesus had done any miracle. It was before Jesus had started his ministry. It was before Jesus had gone to the cross. 
But the father says, I'm pleased with you. You see, the father was pleased with Jesus, not because of what he had done, but because of who he was. You are mine. You're mine. You belong to me. Now, here's what's very, very important in this this recognition of what's happening in Jesus' life. This is what God wants you to hear the Father say over your own life. You are mine, and I'm pleased with you. Imagine just hearing the Father say that over your life in this moment. Now, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, when John writes the, the Gospel of John, he wants us to discover Jesus and what the relationship between the Father and Jesus was so that we can discover it in our own lives. Uh, So as he starts the gospel of John, he gets to John 1 verse 12, and then he writes the following. He says, to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. What's great about this particular scripture is this word for children is the Greek word huios, which means inheritor, son. Uh, As a matter of fact, it's the very same word that is used when the father speaks over Jesus' life and says, you are my beloved son. The word there is huios. And here John writes, he says, For those who receive Jesus, those that accept Jesus, because He's the way, when we accept Him, what happens? We have access to the Father, and now you can hear the Father say over your life, you are mine because you have the right to become huios, son. Now that includes the ladies. You see, if I can be the bride of Christ, you can be a son. (laughs) This sonship is not about gender. This sonship is all about standing, position. You have been accepted as a son in the family, as a huios, as an inheritor in the family. But you have to hear that statement over your life. Today, you need to, in a fresh way, hear that this is what the Father says. You, you are mine. You belong to me, and I'm pleased with you. Not pleased because of what you've done or not done. Because of who you are. You know, there's this story about an eagle that was in the Pretoria Zoo. And this eagle was in a cage for 12 years, and then the authorities decided they're going to set the eagle free. And so they had this project to take this eagle all the way to Mpumalanga, where the natural habitat of these eagles were. And um, when they arrived there, they, uh, 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 some of our friends were there, and they told us this story. And it's amazing. They say it, it, was, it was amazing to watch the release of this eagle. Because there was this anticipation, they're going to open up the cage and the eagle's going to fly out and be free. And so they had the countdown and they opened up the cage and the eagle sat. The eagle was going nowhere. And then they recognized that, um, you know, this eagle needs help because somehow in the last 12 years, this cage had become the defining reference for this eagle. This cage now brought limitation to what this eagle was called to be and to do. And so they recognized they got to get the eagle out of the cage. So they went into the cage and they started chewing the eagle. They say it was very funny. The eagle kind of bounced down on the ground, then bounced, bounced, bounced out of the cage a few meters out. There the eagle sat. (laughs) Now the eagle was out of the cage. But the cage was still in the mind of the eagle. You see... Many times, that's what happens to us. 
We are called to the spacious environment. We are called to this discovery of God being our Father, the creator of the universe being your Father. But somehow there's this cage that limits you to enter into this spacious environment of acceptance where you still think that you have to work for acceptance instead of working from acceptance. But you have to hear the statement of the Father over your life. So here's this eagle not wanting to fly, and so they realize they've got to get it to fly because if it doesn't fly, it'll die. And so they start shouting at the eagle. They're whistling at the eagle. They're explaining. One guy even went and explained to the eagle why he needs to fly. They say one guy went in front of the eagle and started showing the eagle how to fly. But to no avail, the eagle didn't want to fly. And then the amazing thing happened. They say one of the free eagles of the region started circling above. And the next moment, that free eagle gave a cry. And the moment that eagle here on the ground heard that cry. They said there was immediate resonance. There was an immediate sense of connection because the eagle looked up and it was as if in that cry was the revelation, the understanding of the fact that it was not made to live in a cage. It was made for the freedom and for flight. And because they say something ignited in this eagle because it started running, flapping its wings and it soared up into freedom. When I heard this story, it arrested my heart because I recognized that's what happens to us. When we hear the voice of the Father, the acceptance of the Father over our lives in Jesus Christ, where we discover in grace that God has made up His mind about us and that He has decided that we are included in His family and there's nothing that I can do or not do that can affect that. But I am part of this reference. I'm no longer an orphan. I am a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Um, You know, it's interesting when, when John writes, he says, for those who received him. That word is very important to understand. You see, it's not about achieving, it's about receiving. It's how well you receive. Christianity is about receiving. It's about discovering what God has already initiated. And then he says he gives the right (laughs) strong term because you know we're in a time and a season where people are discovering their rights their rights about so many different things where they can put a demand in terms of what they believe is legally theirs but there is no greater right for any human being to discover than the right that you are a child of God it's your right Now, it's in this discovery that you are repositioned to to discover that you are included as a child of God. Um, You are no longer an orphan. You are the beloved. It's interesting, when Jesus goes into the desert, just after this experience of hearing the statement over his life, he goes into the desert and the Bible says the enemy comes to tempt Jesus, but he premises the temptations with this statement, if you are the son. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get Jesus to doubt whether he truly is son. And his strategy does not change. That's exactly what he does to you and me. If he can get us to just doubt whether we truly are huios, inheritors, the beloved of God, in, in, in God's sight. You see, because the moment I doubt that, I get into the orphan spirit mode and I'm back into performance. I lose my authority, I lose my influence, I lose my joy, I lose my vibrancy for the kingdom. And I no longer represent the kingdom of God well here on earth. And this is the question, what on earth are you here for? To manifest something to this world. We 
We see that when the enemy tempts Jesus, he leaves out one very important word. I believe it's an, an intentional omission. It's the word beloved. Because he knew the power of that statement. If you knew that, you are loved. The moment you know that you're loved, it repositions your life. And you've got to hear this statement over your life today in a new and fresh way. God looking at you saying, you're mine, you belong to me, and I love you. I'm pleased with you. My smile is on your life. That repositions you. Now, we see this in the life of Jesus. Jesus was so aware that the Father's intimate presence was his experience. You see, the reward of Christianity is not just going to heaven. The reward of Christianity is being reunited with your Father. Of course, that will find full expression in heaven. But, but we don't wait for that one day. It's not something that will only happen. And now I'm trying to qualify for that. No, I now, because of Christ's work, He is the way. He is the way to the Father. I've been invited to this embrace with the Father. It's interesting when John writes the Gospel of John once again, documenting Jesus' life so that we can discover what God's intent is for our lives. 116 times the concept of Father is repeated. Now, you've got to understand how radical that concept was for that time. That's why they wanted to kill Jesus. They say, because you're making yourself equal to God. How can you call God your Father? But Jesus would make statements like, the Father and I are one. The Father loves the Son. The Father loves me. I do nothing unless I see the Father. Over and over and over, Jesus was reinforcing. He wanted us to understand, this is your privilege. You can be included in this reference. Now, once you understand this, you understand why Jesus said at that day you will know that I'm going to be in my Father and, and you, uh, I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. And Jesus said, if a man loves me and loves my word, my Father will love him and he, we will come to him and make our abode in him. John 14, verse 20 and verse 23. Listen to what Jesus says. God will come and make his dwelling place, his abode in us. You know, when you start to understand that you're part of the family and that the Father is with you, it repositions how you do life, how you engage life, how you manifest the glory of God to our world. Uh, I want to tell you a story. I recently had to go to the bank and I needed the bank to help me with a complex financing issue. But uh, I, uh, uh, as I was walking to the bank, I heard myself speaking to myself, saying, Alan, you're wasting your time. The bank's not going to help you. Well, I got to the, the door of the bank, and I was about to walk in, and I heard myself repeat that. Alan, you're wasting your time. The bank's not going to help you. And the next moment, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me, and I heard God say this to me. Why are you walking into the bank like a loser? I was like, whoa, Lord. <laughs> I didn't even know you spoke that way. I, I thought in that moment, you know, like a loser. And I heard God say to me, have you forgotten that when you walk into this bank, I, the creator of the universe, I've become your father and I will walk into this bank with you. Lift up your head, put your shoulders back, walk in there knowing that I am with you. And then I heard God say, and whether the bank helps you or not, when you walk out of this bank, I, the
the God of the universe that has become your father. I will walk out with you and I promise that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Well, I lifted up my head. I put my shoulders back. I walked into the bank and I said, where is the bank manager? The bank didn't help me. But I remember in that moment, it was not that sense of disappointment and forlorn experience where, oh, my world's falling apart. No. It was like internal communication. God, my Father, they're not helping us. And I knew when I walked out of that bank, God, Creator God, my Father, who promised He will never leave me, never forsake me. He was walking out of that bank with me, and He became my security. It changes the way you do life. You know, when John wants us to understand Jesus, he writes in John 1 verse 4, and he says, In him was life, and the life was the light to the world. It's a little later when when Jesus is quoted by John in John 10, verse 10, where Jesus shares his own life mission statement, and he says, I have come that you might have life. You see, in you is life. You are united with the Father. You are a union. You're part of a family. You've been invited into a new reference and that repositions you. That life in you is the light for the world. It's the glory of God being manifest Why? Because you're living life with an awareness of union with the Father. I'd like to bless you and speak life over you. So would you just receive in this moment as we pray together. Father, our Father. Thank you that we know that you have become our Father and that we welcomed into this family and that every listener that's hearing this, Lord, has had the, the, the privilege to be part of. And if they have not, may they in this moment receive Jesus so that they can become part, that have the right to become children of God. We speak it over their lives to know and to recognize God is your father. You're part of the family. God has welcomed you into a glorious family where he is the father. And we thank you that we can celebrate that today. We thank you, Lord, that we are anxious for nothing because we have a father that cares for us. We honor you, Lord, Jesus, for opening the way, for making the way accessible to the Father. Be glorified in our lives. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Make sure that you get connected to this family on mission by joining us at one of our Sunday services.